for joining us for another Tuesdays with Trey. I'm grateful for your time and your feedback. Doing television is not nearly as easy as some folks make it seem. There are women and men who do it for a living and they are so polished and so professional. It can create the appearance that it's easy. But for the rest of us mere mortals and especially guests on television, we are going to say the wrong thing from time to time or we're not going to communicate as precisely as we intend to. There was an attorney on a show this past week discussing the movement to defund the police. And this guest said, of course, we need cops in certain situations, but there are many situations where we do not need cops. And then he cited mental health situations and domestic violence as two areas where maybe we didn't need the cops after all. I don't know this guest. I've never spoken to him. Perhaps. He did what I have done many times before, which is not perfectly state what it was he was trying to communicate, perhaps. It's really the substance of what he said or implied that I want us to focus on. This mistaken belief that we don't need cops in mental health situations or in domestic violence situations. And that's what this guest and others over the past weeks have said that there are certain instances, certain situations is the word they like to use, where we probably don't need the police. Not, not at least like we used to think we needed the police. So, so let's start with the obvious. Domestic violence or interpersonal violence is a crime. It's not a situation or an instance It's a crime to strike a partner. It's a crime to create an atmosphere of fear or intimidation and threat. These are not family matters or marital or relationship issues. These are not church matters or opportunities for counseling. Domestic or interpersonal violence is a crime, period. So the argument that you do not need cops to investigate or respond to or intervene in crimes is ludicrous. And it's circular, and the argument implodes upon itself. To say you need cops for crimes and then cite a crime as an example when you do not need cops is illogical. And frankly, and I'm sure that's not what this guest intended, but frankly, it's a danger to women. And it is almost always women who are the victims of domestic or interpersonal violence. But his comments also struck a deeper nerve within me of what we ask cops to do in our culture, what we expect of them, the jobs we task them with doing. If our country is really having a debate about whether we need police and what we ask the police to do, then let's have the debate. Let's look at all the things we ask of police, and then we can decide whether or not it needs to be done at all, and if it needs to be done, by whom. Uh, Mental health incidents is another area I frequently hear that we don't need the police. And it is true. There are scores and scores of our fellow citizens who have mental health diagnoses, mental health issues, and they are not a threat to anyone. They are perfectly peaceful. They don't require law enforcement involvement at all. And I would say that's the overwhelming majority of our fellow citizens who suffer from mental health related diagnoses. They do not and will not ever require law enforcement intervention. We do not need to keep those with mental health issues in jail awaiting trial simply because there is inadequate access to mental health treatment. I used to meet with the captain over our detention center on a regular basis to discuss the jail list. Those women and men who had been in jail awaiting trial for the longest period of time and a tremendous percentage of those in jail, not prison, mind you, this is jail awaiting trial. That percentage was always high as it related to those with mental health issues. So no, of course, those with mental health issues do not need to be exclusively handled by the police, prosecutors, and the justice system. But some do. Wait right there. We'll have more next. I prosecuted a man who, when he was four years of age, tried to kill his mother. 
the image of a four-year-old trying to kill his mother and then sitting in the waiting room of a psychiatrist's office breaks all of our hearts. You do not need to have children or grandchildren to lament the image of a four-year-old child with his or her feet dangling off the edge of a chair because they're not even tall enough to touch the floor, seated in the waiting room, waiting to be seen by a psychiatrist. But four-year-olds grow up, sometimes with treatment, sometimes without. But it is universally true that four-year-olds become five-year-olds, and then 15-year-olds, and 25-year-olds. It was not the four-year-old I prosecuted. It was the older version. This defendant broke into the home of a couple who lived beside him, came in under cover of night. Now, he'd come in earlier in the day, to be sure. He came and asked for a ride to the grocery store, and that older neighbor took him and did one better. He did even better than giving him a ride. He took him to the grocery store, and then he bought his groceries for him. This older neighbor not only gave the defendant a ride to the grocery store, but he bought his groceries for him. That was during the day. But then came night. And this defendant came through a sliding glass door as this man and his wife, this husband and wife, this dear, kind, neighborly couple, lay sleeping in their bed. First, the defendant beat the husband to death with a hammer. But the side of his head was caved in. There was blood from the floor to the ceiling, literally. In the crime scene photos, you could see the arm of the husband reaching toward his wife, trying to protect his wife, trying to save his wife. You want to let your mind imagine that scene, an older couple sleeping peacefully in their own bed. An intruder comes in armed with a hammer and attacks, caving in the skull of a sleeping man. And even in his death, this husband is reaching out, trying to save what he loved the most, which was his wife. But he did not. She too was beaten to death with a hammer. Both of her eyeballs were, to quote the autopsy report, absent. That means he literally beat her head in so violently her eyes were gone. And then he raped her post-mortem. For those unfamiliar with Latin, he raped her after he killed her. Who do you think responded to the crime scene? Who do you think we ask in our society to go into a crime scene as horrific as anything I have ever seen as a prosecutor? I only had to look at the pictures. That's all I had to do to prepare for the murder trial. And still, after 10 years, I cannot get the image out of my mind of a husband reaching his arm across a blood-soaked bed to touch his wife. But I didn't have to go into the house. I didn't have to go into the bedroom. I didn't have to process the bed. I didn't have to process the bodies. I didn't have to take blood swabs. I didn't have to take vaginal swabs. I didn't have to take anal swabs. Who do you think does that? You think politicians do that? You think community activists do that? You think television commentators do that? Cops do that. And then they have to go find the person who committed this act of utter depravity and arrest him. Do you want to do that? Do you want do you want to arrest murder suspects, advise them of their rights, even though they're covered in the blood of their victims? Who does that for us? Cops do. They do a lot of other things we're not willing or able to do also. Do any of you have children or grandchildren? Actually, you don't even need children or grandchildren to understand there are some jobs that leave you emotionally changed forever. Early on, when I was a district attorney, a child went missing, a small child, able to walk, but just barely. It's the worst fear any parent, any family member, any loved one can have, a missing child. 
you scream their name, you run as fast as you can, looking in the yard, looking in the closets. Are they hiding? Are they playing? Are they really missing? Your mind runs to the worst places where seconds feel like hours. You exhaust your search. You have looked everywhere you know to look, and you have done everything you know. For the full podcast, go to foxnewspodcast.com.